Synthetic differential geometry is a fascinating modern approach to the geometry of smooth spaces. In this subject, we're going to look at some really fundamental issues, like how we model the continuum and how we can think about smooth spaces. And we're going to approach these kind of ideas from a new perspective. The traditional study of smooth spaces is mostly based on the idea of using real numbers. It's essentially based on arithmetic. But what we're going to find is that if we take a different approach using logic and axioms and so on, we can actually get a sort of theory of geometry, which in some sense works in a much cleaner way and makes thinking about these kind of smooth spaces much easier. And it really provides a sort of route to think about some really deep ideas to do with manifolds and geometry. And these kind of ideas have lots of really interesting applications as well, like to fluid dynamics or Einstein's theory of relativity, for example. Okay, so synthetic differential geometry is a fascinating field where we use some really powerful ideas of modern mathematics to think about geometry and space in a very sort of rigorous way. And we make a kind of framework for doing geometry where things work very pleasantly. So over the last few years, there have been developments in areas like category theory and intuitionistic logic, which have allowed people to define this new kind of subject of synthetic differential geometry. Now, for most of the introduction of this video, I'm not really going to get into category theory very much. I'm going to focus more on the geometry and the kind of intuitive aspects of this theory. I'm going to focus on explaining the core ideas in a kind of geometric or visual way. But there is a kind of deep connection here with category theory. And I'll also make some content explaining how to think about this subject in a rigorous way using category theory. So what's synthetic differential geometry all about? Well, it basically is about modeling spaces and modeling continuous things. I would say that it's a new sort of modern approach to thinking about the continuum and thinking about manifolds. So the really core idea in synthetic differential geometry has to do with smoothness and infinitesimals. So as the name suggests, Differential geometry has a lot to do with differentiation. And what that basically means is that if you have some curve, then you're interested in the rate of change of that curve. So suppose we have some function which takes in a real number and outputs a real number. So we could make a plot of this function kind of like what I'm showing here. So the idea of making a plot like this is that this horizontal X axis represents the number that we're inputting, the quantity that we're inputting into our function. And then we draw this curve so that the height of this curve above a given point shows what value that point is sent to by our function F. So for example, if this is two, and this is three, then we'd know here that this function sends the input two to the output three. Now, one of the things we're interested in doing is working out the derivative of a function like this at a particular point. So let's say we have a particular input, a particular value, let's say x dash, and we want to determine the derivative of this function at x dash. So what does that mean? So one way to think of this is that we're going to draw a line that's just sort of tangent to our curve. It just sort of kisses our curve above x dash. And then 
we're really just interested in calculating the gradient of that line we've just drawn. The gradient of this sort of line will be the derivative of our function f at this point x dash. And this derivative is going to be the gradient of this line, which is just going to be the amount that this line increases as we move one unit to the right. So this is one way to think about the derivative. Another way to think about it is that if we zoom in very close to our curve and we think, well, um, here we have what's going on at x dash. And then if we think, and if we then increase this value x dash by a small amount, let's say delta x, and then we determine how much this curve increases. So this would be f of x dash plus delta x. Take away f of x dash. Then the way that we could calculate this derivative is that if we look at this value, which is basically the amount that our function has increased as we've pumped up the x value, the input by this small amount delta x. Well, if we take this value that I've circled here and we divide it by the value delta x, then that's going to give us the derivative when we make this delta x small enough. Okay, so the way that people normally say it is that the derivative is dy by dx. Okay, so they call this quantity I've circled dy, or in this case, I'll write delta y. And if we divide that by delta x, this is basically the amount that the sort of y coordinate changes on our curve when we vary the x coordinate by a small amount. Now, the issue here. Um, one thing that I think makes calculus rather difficult um, for people to get their heads around at the beginning is that we really want to be thinking about this kind of idea in the scenario where we have um, basically delta x being sort of limitingly small, whatever that means. And so there's a sort of theory of limits and there's a theory about why for many kind of functions we're interested in as we make this kind of delta x, this horizontal change smaller and smaller, we do kind of approach a proper value. And so if you like the derivative of a function around a particular point is well defined. But um, this theory is rather involved and there's a lot of sort of background that you need and when we do synthetic differential geometry, we can really sort of sidestep a lot of this discussion about limits because the way that arguments to do with limits usually work is that um, we imagine we're making our sort of quantity so small that we can disregard certain kind of features of our function. In particular, a trick one often does in calculus is that um, one assumes that this kind of delta x value is so small that if we have delta x squared, we can ignore it, right? Because if you have a very small number and then you square it, you get a much smaller number. And the idea then is that we think of those quantities, those sort of squares of things like delta x as being so small that we can actually ignore them. Now that's fine, but the sort of details of it rely on this fairly involved kind of theory of limits. And instead, what happens in synthetic differential geometry is that we actually do have what we call nil square infinitesimals. We're actually going to assume that we do have these kind of quantities, which are so small that even though they might not be zero, they literally have the property that squaring them actually gives us zero. OK, so this is at first glance a rather strange idea, but it makes dealing with all sorts of features of continuous spaces like, for example, derivatives and integrals much easier. And it also has lots of other benefits as well. So rather than this kind of classical theory of limits, 
which um, really involves quite a lot of thought to be able to set up these ideas of, um, you know, when you can take derivatives, when these kind of arguments about vanishing with small quantities work and all the rest of it, all those details, um, we don't have to worry about them in synthetic differential geometry because basically we have it as a sort of axiom that we have these null square infinitesimals and we have these quantities which literally have the property that squaring them gives zero. And also the way that synthetic differential geometry is set up means that all of our kind of maps are continuous. You see, another kind of situation where you could have problems in a situation like this would be what if this kind of function had a sort of discontinuity? Okay, what if suddenly at some point uh, the value just suddenly decreased or something like this? Okay, um, so then let's say you wanted to work out the derivative of the function at this place here where we have a discontinuity. Well, the theory of derivatives kind of breaks down when you have these sort of discontinuities in your function. But this kind of situation won't happen for us in synthetic differential geometry because we're basically going to assume, because we're basically going to set things up in such a way that all of our maps from one space to another are all continuous. So we kind of can uniformly apply these kind of ideas of calculus, but they're going to look simpler for us because we're going to propose the presence of these kind of nil square infinitesimals. So the main kind of idea in synthetic differential geometry is to have a new way of thinking about what this continuum is. Traditionally, this sort of line, this continuum, is modeled by the real numbers. Okay, so these are the numbers which they include the counting numbers, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Also the fractions, and also these sort of so-called irrational numbers, like the square root of 2, and pi, and so on. So this is the normal sort of approach. But what we do in synthetic differential geometry is something different. We suppose we have something else, which we call the smooth line. We'll also denote it with an R. But it's, it's very similar to the real numbers. In a sense, it looks a lot like the real numbers, but it has some different sorts of features. And basically, in a sense, it's a better behaved continuum than the real numbers. Um, in a sense, which makes calculus much easier and also crucially, this new kind of idea of a continuum leads to better behaved spaces. Okay, so in ordinary kind of differential geometry, you have your uh, real numbers and then you use those to build up manifolds. In synthetic differential geometry, we have this idea of a smooth line and we sort of use that to build up this idea of smooth spaces. And so we end up with a whole bunch of different spaces. And in fact, these form a category. And the really great thing, or one really great thing about synthetic differential geometry is that this kind of collection of spaces that we have has some really, really nice properties, okay? Properties which are extremely useful for thinking about geometry and for thinking about things like physics, for example. So let me now tell you the core idea of synthetic differential geometry. So here's our smooth line. We'll call it R. And this line R has lots of similarities to our normal kind of line of real numbers. So in particular, we have zero, we have one, we have the idea of adding, and we have the idea of multiplying values on this line. But here's the big new idea. We suppose that there are some values on this line, values which are very, very close to zero. Okay, so what we're going to do is suppose that we have a part of this smooth line that's very, very, very close to zero.
and we're going to call things in this part nil square infinitesimals okay so this part is called delta and essentially we're going to imagine that delta consists of these things which are on this line but they're so close to zero that they actually have the feature that if we square these values we literally get zero okay so we can think of delta as the set of x on this line which have the property that x squared is equal to zero okay now here's the big novelty we ask what in this collection of nil square infinitesimals and of course zero is in this collection delta right zero obviously has this property that if we square zero we get zero but the critical thing is that we imagine that there are other values in this kind of collection of nil square infinitesimals so this is one of the main novel ideas in synthetic differential geometry it's, it's really quite sort of disruptive okay so how could there be a number which is not zero which has the property that if we multiply it by itself we get zero well in a sense there can't be such a number right not not in our conventional way of thinking about arithmetic but this is not conventional arithmetic this is a new kind of field where we're sort of building things up axiomatically and so we have to sort of open our minds a bit to this new kind of possibility of setting things up this way and so let's keep an open mind and explore what the kind of implications of having these sort of nil square infinitesimals are these things are also sometimes called micro quantities so i'll revisit the kind of um, logical issues that arise because of this shortly but before that i want to introduce the main kind of idea that makes this kind of approach so worthwhile so firstly just sort of geometrically how can we think about these nil square infinitesimals well here's our line and what we have here is this parabola okay so if we draw a plot of this so if we draw a plot of this if this is x then this is x squared okay so this is really a plot of the function f of x equals x squared. And the way that we can think about this kind of collection of infinitesimals or this part of the line which um, consists of these infinitesimals, we can think of it as the place where this kind of parabola touches our smooth line. Now, sort of classically, it's imagined that this parabola just touches our line at a single point. But I don't think it's too much of a stretch of the imagination to imagine that the parabola actually touches the line at a sort of infinitesimally small kind of piece of the line. Maybe we could call it a linette. And another way we could visualize this is um, imagine we have this line R and we have a circle which just touches the line. Again, we can imagine that it's this kind of infinitesimal region of the line delta, which is where that circle touches the line. Now, the really critical idea here is that we're going to set things up in such a way that our spaces our kind of things that our kind of objects that we're going to think about end up automatically being continuous and so for example when we speak about curves we're going to be thinking about continuous curves our functions are going to be continuous so the critical idea is that if we have a kind of curve and we look at this curve in a very kind of zoomed in way about a particular point we're actually going to see that around that point we're actually going to see that around that point the curve looks 
like it is flat, okay? So in a sense, this sort of little region, this delta, this kind of region of nil square infinitesimals is like such a small thing that if we look at a curve on that kind of scale, the curve will look flat. And so we really have this kind of idea of a Lynette. And, and actually, if you have a look at the writing of a lot of different philosophers and mathematicians like Poincaré and Descartes and Hermann Weyl, Leibniz and so on, then we find a lot of support for this sort of different approach towards geometry. You see, basically the classical approach is that the line is made out of points. And um, it's a little bit problematic, right? Because the line is really a continuum. And so in a sense, it can be a bit funny to think of it just being made out of points. So in synthetic differential geometry, we rather consider um, a sort of lunette, a sort of tiny infinitesimal little bit of a line to be the sort of um, main part of a line that we're interested in. Okay then, so the way that we set synthetic differential geometry up is to think about these nil square infinitesimals as having a very special feature. In particular, we want this principle that I've written at the bottom here to hold true. We call this the principle of micro straightness, and it's really essential to the subject of synthetic differential geometry. So let me explain. This is our smooth line that we call R. Now, let's suppose that we have any map from R to R. So we have something like this. And so let's call this map G. Okay, so if we have X down here, then we're going to have G of X here. Now here's the thing. We know that near zero on our smooth line, we have these nil square infinitesimals. And so if we just look at how these get mapped under G, then we can sort of restrict this function G. We can restrict the inputs to only be these nil square infinitesimals. So we're just thinking about how G works on these kind of values. And so we can just think about that. And this gives us basically this function f. So we can think of f as any kind of map from the nil square infinitesimals to the smooth line. So this is our new sort of focus. What we're interested in is how does this map f from our nil square infinitesimals to our smooth line, how does it work? And basically the principle of micro straightness says that it basically gives a straight line on the plot. Okay. So in particular, what this principle is saying is that if we pick any value in these nil square infinitesimals, let's say epsilon, and then we ask ourselves, what is F of epsilon? Well, the answer is that there's going to be a sort of certain gradient of this line, B, okay? And we're going to have that F of E is equal to F of zero plus B times epsilon. Okay, so let me draw this again, because I think this picture is getting a bit too busy. So if we just sort of zoom in, this is going to be F of zero. So really what this principle of micro straightness is saying is that when we zoom in on a curve, so we're looking at it as closely as our kind of region of nil square infinitesimals, then that curve looks like a straight line. Okay. So if we zoom in on this, we can find F of zero here. 
for this map f from the null square infinitesimals to the smooth line. And we can also work out the gradient of this line because it will actually be straight. So there's going to be a certain sort of gradient b to this line. And that gradient is just going to be the sort of amount that this line goes up. If we move a sort of unit across, if we imagine extending the line, so that b is just the ordinary idea of the gradient. And the critical idea is that there's this unique b, which is basically giving us a gradient. And then we have the notion that for any of these nil square infinitesimals, epsilon, we have this kind of equation holding true, that f of epsilon equals f of zero plus b times epsilon. So this is our principle of micro straightness, and it really makes the whole subject of synthetic differential geometry much easier. So these are the basic assumptions. Now, now one can get into how this subject of synthetic differential geometry is set up in a much deeper kind of way. And in fact, we actually have to sort of widen our view of logic. So, so rather than working in classical logic, where everything is either true or false, in synthetic differential geometry, we actually work with a more general sort of logic, something called intuitionistic logic. Now, practically, for the purposes of me explaining this video, this isn't going to make very much difference. But if one wants to set up synthetic differential geometry in a very kind of rigorous way, um, it's important to be aware of this kind of idea. Um, and it might sound like, and it might sound complicated or fantastical to have to go outside of the normal sort of classical logic to set up a theory of geometry. But really what it sort of just boils down to is just to say that when we're arguing certain points mathematically, we want to be constructive about things because we're not just supposing that uh, statements are either true or false. There could be some other kind of truth values that might be out there. Um, and what this really boils down to is that we can't be sure of being able to use things like proof by contradiction. If you can show that something's not, if you could show that something's not false, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true and things like this. But essentially, the familiar kind of ideas of logic, for example, if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C, and the way that things like and and or work and all the rest of it are pretty much the same as in classical logic. So basically, in synthetic differential geometry, when we set it up properly, we're very kind of clear about what our axioms are, even about how the kind of underlying logic of our system works. And this leads to a much cleaner theory, but it also leads to a theory where things are much better behaved in, in some sense. So to give a sort of example of this, let's think about a situation in physics. Let's suppose that we have a ball that is moving through space. Okay, so let's say someone's just thrown a tennis ball or something, and there it goes flying through space. So let's think about that kind of situation. So we have our ball, let's call that B. And we also have the kind of space that that's moving in. So let's call that kind of space S. And we also have time, okay, going on. So what's the situation? Well, we could say that any kind of point inside the ball and any kind of time is associated with somewhere in space. OK, so if we take a, a little uh, bit of a material inside this ball and a particular time, then that bit of material is going to be in somewhere in space. 
So we could say that this situation is described by a sort of map from the product of the ball with time to space. So we could model time as one of these smooth lines. We can model this ball as a smooth space. And then we can say that there's a sort of map um, from the ball times time to space. And if you think about how this would work, for example, um, and if you think about how this would work, for example, in set theory, um, there we'd be representing this ball as a set of points, time as a set of points, b times t is the set of all pairs of a point little b of the ball and a time little t. And each of those such pairs is going to get mapped to a certain place in space. And that would be how this situation is described. Now, we basically have a similar situation uh, in synthetic differential geometry. It's just that actually these kind of ideas of products of spaces and kind of maps are really dealt with by category theory. Okay, so um, I'll talk about the formalities later. But one of the greatest things that we get out of this synthetic differential geometry is that if we pick any two spaces, let's say, just for example, S and T, then there's going to be another space that we call S to the power of T. Now, this is what we call in category theory an exponential object. And essentially, this is a space that represents all the maps from t to s. So let's try and think about this in this physics context. So what's a map from time to space? Well, if we're going to model time as our sort of smooth line, then what's going to be a map from uh, time to space? Let's say a map alpha. Well, it's just going to map this time to be a sort of trajectory in space. Okay, so alpha is going to map this smooth line into some kind of curve in S. And so if you think about, for example, um, a particle inside this ball, um, as we throw the ball, uh, as time goes on, that's going to trace out a sort of path in space, a trajectory, if you like. And we can think of that as a map from this smooth line into S. So for example, if you take a piece of string and you glue it to your wall, you can think of that as a map from the string to the wall. So anyway, the point here is that this whole sort of collection of maps from T to S in our kind of scenario, actually forms another one of these smooth spaces. And this is wonderfully useful for doing physics. And in fact, because of the details of exponential objects, there's actually a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between maps like this from B times T to S and maps like this from B to S to the power of T. So in other words, physically, there's another way to think about this situation. So we can think about our situation like this, okay? We have a map that sends any particle within our ball and any time to a place in space, okay? So maybe this particle at two seconds past 3 p.m. is at a particular place in space, for example. But here's another way to think about our situation. And what this is saying is that for any particle within our ball, there's going to be a trajectory of that particle, a map from time to space. So if we pick a particular particle within our ball, then there's going to be a trajectory, a path, a map from time to space that that kind of particle takes. And there's a way to put these two kind of perspectives on things into correspondence with each other. In fact, we can go even further and we can then say, well, this initial situation 
where we're saying we're mapping a particle of our ball in a particular time to a particular place in space. Um, we could just think of that the other way around. Just reversing the order of things. And then we can also apply this correspondence. And now we have a third way of looking at the situation. And now we're saying that we can also think of our situation so that at any point in time, we have this sort of map from the particles in our ball to space. Okay, so in other words, if we take a snapshot of this kind of movie of this ball floating through space, then there's a certain place where each of those particles of that ball are in space, and that can be encoded by a map. And so being able to do all this sort of thing is wonderfully useful for physics and for geometry. So I'm using this kind of notation to denote a certain kind of correspondence we have between different kinds of maps. So when I use this kind of horizontal line notation in this kind of context, I basically mean that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the type of things pictured above the line and the type of things pictured below the line. So in particular, if we have a map from B times T to S, then that corresponds to a map from B to S to the power of T. And these two kinds of things are in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. Okay, so there's lots of really wonderful aspects to synthetic differential geometry, which make thinking about space a lot easier. And one of them is really this idea of being able to form exponential objects. So um, I'll talk about the formalities of category theory later, but essentially we can think of there being what we call a category of smooth spaces. We sometimes denote this as S. But I mean, basically, we can think about there being a so-called category of smooth spaces. And here it's really a collection of objects, um, which are smooth spaces. And then we have arrows between those smooth spaces, which are maps. OK, so this is really how we like to think about it. And in this kind of way of thinking, these kind of things are like exponential objects. Anyway, um, there's something very beautiful that we can do if we have a space, let's say, A, we can consider this exponential object, A to the power of delta. And so if we think about, and so if we think about A as some kind of a smooth space, then A to the power of delta the kind of things in that space are going to be maps from delta to A. So let's think about such a map F. And basically the way that we can think about that is that it's like a little vector, a little tangent vector in our space. Okay, so here's our space A. And then this is basically what F looks like. So here's our, uh, this is our nil square infinitesimals and here's zero. And then we have this sort of map and that's really giving us a sort of tangent vector in our space A and F of zero that's going to be where this vector emanates from. Okay, so that's really the sort of base of the vector, f of zero. So we can do lots of interesting things now. I mean, in particular, a to the power of delta, this is actually what differential geometers call the tangent bundle of this space a. And so we can think about, for example, what would R to the power of delta look like? Well, basically, this is the sort of space um, formed from all of the maps from our nil square infinitesimals to our smooth line. And if we look again at our principle of micro straightness, we find that any such map, any such 
map F from our nil square infinitesimals to R can be described by a pair of numbers. Okay. Um, F of zero. Well, I say a pair of values. Okay. F of zero and B and together that pair, you know, this point and the gradient of this line describe exactly how this kind of map works. So basically the kind of gradient and the starting point. And so what we really have then is that R to the power of delta is isomorphic to R times R. In other words, pairs of values from our smooth line describe a map from our nil square infinitesimals to R. And this turns out to have some really pleasant consequences as well. So for example, let's now consider this more general case where we have some space A. And let's suppose, for example, that's N dimensional. In fact, let's think about all of N dimensional space. Okay. So what about if we have a tangent bundle of that? Well, we can basically do a bit of manipulation we can rewrite this as r to the power of delta to the power of n. We can use our formula here to say that this basically looks like r times r to the power of n. Or we can rewrite it again to say that this is like a pair of points from r to the power of n. And so what this is really saying is that a vector in n-dimensional space is described by saying where its base point is which we can do with n numbers. And then another n numbers are gonna give us the sort of direction of this vector and its magnitude in different directions. Okay then, so let's think some more about these kind of tangent vectors. So we can form this sort of tangent bundle, a to the power of delta. And a point of that is going to be a tangent vector and a tangent vector is basically a map from delta to a a map from our nil square infinitesimals to a and basically we can think of that as a little arrow in a now a vector like that uh, is going to have a base point v of zero that's the point of a where that vector emanates from and so there's going to be a sort of map from a to the power of delta to a which just takes a vector and gives its base point okay simple stuff um but then we can also think about more interesting sorts of maps. So let's call this map pi, okay? So basically um, for a vector v, pi of v gives the base point of that vector. So that's v of zero. But now here's a big idea. Let's say we pick a point p in our space. Now we can think about what we might want to call pi to the minus one of p or if you like this is the collection of all vectors which have base point p or we could describe this in category theory as the pullback of p along pi but i won't get into that but basically we can think of this as the tangent space of m at p so think about all of the vectors which have p as their base point and that whole collection of vectors forms a space and this is the tangent space of a at p so you see we get these really powerful sorts of ideas coming out of synthetic differential geometry i'll explain another really big idea so the next big idea i want to explain and this is making some contact with calculus is that we can also define vector fields okay so think about a space and then we have these sort of vector fields like these um basically a little arrow 
uh, pointing out of every sort of point in our space. And these can describe things like how wind flows around the earth or all sorts of things in, in physics, actually. So one of the best things about synthetic differential geometry is that we can use these ideas about infinitesimals and tangent vectors to describe some concepts um, from differential geometry in a really, really easy kind of way. So in particular, we have this idea of a vector field on A. So suppose we have some space A and we can imagine this sort of field of flow lines a little bit like how wind is sometimes illustrated on weather reports where we have this kind of field of arrows which is showing how things flow okay um, and the formal notion of it and the formalization of this is what's called a vector field and we can think about it in these kind of terms so it's basically just a map zeta from our space a to our tangent bundle a to the power of delta which has the property that for every point p in our space a we have that the base point of the vector zeta of p is p itself okay so in other words zeta of p of zero is p or a more kind of um if we want to describe this in category theory, not that I'm getting into the details much, but just to say briefly, we could describe this notion like this. We could, we could say that if we do this pi map, which sends a vector to its base point, then doing that after zeta is going to give the identity map of A. Or in other words, we could say that zeta is a section of this map pi that we've already described anyway the point is that these vector fields are very useful because we can describe all sorts of situations where things are going to move around in a space using a vector field and moreover this sort of correspondence which we've already talked about which has to do with exponential objects comes into play here and helps us to connect with lots of really interesting kinds of ideas in and helps us to connect with lots of really interesting kinds of ideas to do with differential geometry so the key idea is that if we have these spaces b t and s then we have this kind of correspondence here okay so basically the way this works is let's say we have some map f from b times t to s for any three spaces b t and s well then we can transform that to be this map f dash and basically uh, we can think that f dash of b is going to be a map from t to s which has the property that doing it on t is going to give f of b comma t okay so that's the basic idea between this sort of correspondence and uh, if you see my video on exponential objects uh, this will be clearer but anyway we can use that kind of idea for vector fields because let's say we have a vector field on a so zeta from a to a to the power of delta so okay let's say we have this vector field zeta and so we can represent this as a map into this exponential object this tangent bundle a to the power of delta but then using the kind of properties of exponential objects we see that such a map corresponds to a map like this from a times delta to a And so we might want to call such a map z to u. And so whereas this thing up here is a vector field on A, we could call this a description of microflows on A 
And the key feature of this map is that it's going to send a point P and an infinitesimal epsilon to the vector that we get um, by moving epsilon along zeta of P. So this is a this is what we call a microflow. And it's basically describing for us how we can sort of move along here if we pick a point in a particular time to flow along. But we can also write this situation in yet another way. So in particular, we can sort of change around the order of these things and we can make a sort of equivalent map. And then we can apply the same kind of trick. And then we get a map like this. And this really gives us what we might call micro paths in A. So the idea here is basically that if we specify an amount epsilon, then we actually have a map from this whole space to itself, which is just moving every uh, point a very small distance around on this vector field. So it's something that's kind of close to being an identity map. So the way that we can think of this kind of microflow here for this vector field is that if we pick some point P and then we do um, this map on P comma epsilon, that's going to give us the new point that we get by moving epsilon along the vector field from P. And we can use this idea of microflow to get the idea of a flow line, which really is giving us the sort of notion almost of um, finding the trajectory of how something evolves in a dynamical system, or almost this kind of notion of kind of solving differential equations. So in particular, we can have the idea of a flow line, which is basically the sort of idea of following this vector field, kind of flowing along it. So let's suppose we have some interval of our smooth line, and let's call that interval L comma R. So um, this is just some interval and a flow line of this vector field is going to be a map from this interval to our space A. And we call this map Q. And here's a picture of an example. And it basically has the property that for every nil square infinitesimal epsilon and for every And for every uh, t in our interval, we have this kind of equation holding. Uh, and what this says is that the point which is sort of t plus epsilon along this flow line, or if you like the value in this uh, interval, um, which is t plus epsilon, gets mapped under this flow line q to this particular point in our space A. And what is this point? Well, if we find q of t, so here's q of t, okay, I'll use a different color. Here is q of t. And then if we sort of move epsilon along our vector field, um, then this is going to be the new point. This is Q of T plus epsilon. So the fact that we can formulate this um, zeta U here, this kind of micro flow using the sort of properties of uh, the exponential object basically gives us this kind of map. And then we can use this to define exactly what we mean by a flow line. And this gives us a notion of basically what it means to, for example, to sort of find a trajectory which flows along a particular vector field. And basically you can use these kind of ideas I've discussed to formulate ideas of directional derivatives and differential equations. And then you can formulate this idea of flow lines as corresponding to these kind of solutions of uh, differential equations, which basically tell you how things are going to flow around in space.
but it's so naturally connected with these ideas of nilsware infinitesimals and it falls out so and it falls out so effortlessly from this kind of theory of synthetic differential geometry okay so let's talk about how we can use these infinitesimals to do differentiation so let's suppose we have a map f from r to r and what we want to do is we want to differentiate this so here's a plot of f of x against x and we want to differentiate this so we want to determine what we'd normally call df by dx and we want to evaluate this at a particular point let's say v okay so geometrically um, here's a point v this is a possible input and we want to work out what's the gradient of the slope um, at that point so here we have this line and we want to find out how many units this line goes up when we move one unit to the right okay and that's the derivative um, of f with respect to x at this point v or we could say the gradient of this curve at f uh, so how do we determine it? Well, firstly, let's give it a different name. Let's call this thing f dash of v. Okay. Um, so how do we determine this derivative f dash? Well, let's think about some values. Okay. So this is v and here's, uh, let's say, a point v plus y for some number y. And so this here would be, up here we'd have, uh, this would be f of v, and this would be f of v plus y. Okay, that would be this value here, and this would be f of v. So let's suppose that this y here is something small, okay? So let me write this down. So we're going to suppose that y is something small, in particular y is one of these nil square infinitesimals and now we're interested in f of v plus y okay so we're interested in what's the value of f just a little bit um just very close to v okay so just a small distance away um and so what we can really do is we can define a map from infinitesimals to values on our smooth line and we're going to call it g and we're going to define it so that for any nil square infinitesimal y we have that g of y is equal to f of v plus y so what we're really doing is we're looking at the behavior of f kind of close to v and we're thinking about how f behaves in this kind of little neighborhood of um, this point v and um, we're using that to sort of get we're getting that information and using it to form this sort of map from these nil square infinitesimals to our line and so now we have this kind of situation and the way this is going to look if we sort of zoom in close to here and we're going to see a situation like this now. So now, so now our x-axis is consisting of these nil square infinitesimals, and our y-axis is the smooth line. And we're plotting this uh, this map G, but that's just going to be a straight line, right? Because of our principle of micro straightness. And we know from our principle of micro straightness that there's going to exist this value B, such that we've got that um, g of y is going to equal g of 0 plus y times b. Um, 
for any y which is a nil square infinitesimal. Okay, and so now this b here, this is exactly what we want because this is basically going to be the gradient of our curve around v. So this b that we get, this unique b, is actually going to be f dash of v. So that's how we can, <clears throat> so that's how we can define the derivative in synthetic differential geometry. Okay, so since I've introduced the idea of differentiation, um, I think I ought to also describe this integration principle because then we've really seen a lot of the kind of fundamental ideas in this synthetic differential geometry. And it's really very similar to how integrations ordinarily defined. So let's suppose we have this map F from our unit interval to our smooth line. And our integration principle proposes that given such a map, there exists this unique map G from our, uni from our unit interval to R, which has the property that the derivative of G is equal to F and also G of zero equals zero. And this G um, is called the definite integral of F over this interval from zero to X. And normally we write G of X like this, okay? So basically we're sort of formally defining integration as in some sense for sort of opposite of differentiation. Okay, so that concludes the first part of this video, which has been a sort of intuitive, rough look at how synthetic geometry works. Now for the next bit, we're going to try and look at how things work in a much more rigorous sort of way. So um, basically there's some sort of prerequisites for really understanding these ideas fully. Now, if you like, um, you can watch the sort of notation that comes up and think about it as if it's notation from set theory. Um, for example, we're going to be writing things like this, x dot r such that phi of x. And you can think of that similar to the sort of notation that you'd see in set theory, which is like the set of x in r such that x satisfies this formula phi of x or such that phi of x is true. But I mean, really what we're going to be talking about is the mitchell benabal language. Really, what we're going to be doing is talking about what's going on in synthetic differential geometry using this internal language of the topos. So this is one way you can um, this is one way you can follow along. You can watch my uh, videos on category theory for beginners, the the one on the mitchell benabal language, the internal language of the topos, and also my video on topos theory essentials. And that should be enough to understand uh, what I'm talking about here. If you want a sort of shortcut, I'll um, I'll just try to uh, mention very quickly the the real basic ideas. Um, a topos has an object called omega in it. Now um, there's also a certain kind of arrow kind called a monomorphism, and a monomorphism, um, so if F is a monomorphism, that's an arrow, let's say from A to B, is defined by the feature that if we have two parallel arrows coming into the source of our arrow, then we have the feature that if F after X equals F after Y, then that implies that X equals Y. Or another way that you could think about monomorphisms is that if you give them different inputs, then you always get different outputs. Anyway, a monomorphism, we sometimes draw it like this with a sort of tail on the back of the arrow. And it really represents a sort of sub-object in sets. These are representing subsets, sort of defined by injective functions. And 
our category of smooth spaces is a special kind of category called a topos. And that means it has a special kind of object called omega. Now this has the special property that um, any arrow, say from an object A into omega, is going to be associated with a sort of sub-object of that object A. And conversely, for every sort of sub-object of A, there's a corresponding kind of arrow into omega. When I say a sub-object of A, I just mean a monomorphism into A. Now, the way that you can think of this is you can think of omega as an object which is representing truth values. Okay, so the easiest way to think about it is that in the category set, um, the object is sets, and there's an object called omega, and that's for set true and false. And if you think about it, a function into this set of true and false is sort of defining a subset of the source of that function. So for example, let's say we have the set one, two, and three, and we send one and two to true and three to false. Well, that's sort of like selecting this kind of subset of one and two, because they're the things where membership in our kind of subset is true, if you like. So you can think of this arrow into omega as defining um, which members, as defining which elements are members of the kind of subset that we're defining. So this is the basic idea of the, so this is the basic idea of a topos. So the other really big idea about topos is, is that if we pick an object B, well then there's going to be a category which we call sub B. Now the objects of sub B are the fundamentally different kind of sub objects of B or monomorphisms into B. And we order them by containment. So in particular, if we have two monomorphisms into B, let's say M and N, well, we say that M is contained in N when there exists an arrow K such that M is equal to N after K. And so such M and N would be objects in this category sub B. And in this case where M is contained in N, we'd have an arrow from M to N. So what this is really is a partially ordered set where we're ordering our sub-objects by containment. And then there are various nice properties of this category of sub-objects. It's actually what you might call a bi-Cartesian closed category. It's actually a hating algebra. So if you have a look on my videos, I have a couple of uh, quite recent videos, um, Foundations 4, Logic and Partially Ordered Sets, and also Foundations 5, Intuitionistic Logic and Type Theory. And in these videos, I talk quite closely about how to actually um, think about these kind of hating algebras, because it turns out that they have some really nice properties. Uh, so in particular, in this sub B, um, if you take the product of a couple of objects, then that corresponds to the idea of the intersection of two of these sub-objects. And the co-product in sub B corresponds to the union of sub-objects. There's also a terminal object that corresponds to the full sub-object. There's also a initial object that corresponds to the empty sub-object. And we also have an idea of exponentiation. So we have exponential objects and they sort of represent containment. I'll just write containment here. And also we can model the idea of negation by thinking about things like this. Now, another thing we can do um, 
we have this sort of, we have these three different kinds of views. I mean, this first view is we're just sort of doing category theory operations. The second view is we're thinking about these things as sub-objects. The third kind of view is that for all of these sub-objects, we have these sort of corresponding arrows into omega, and they're basically converting what's going on in this sort of sub-object world into a sort of truth value world. Um, this will be much clearer if you watch my videos on topos theory, but basically um, by thinking about the kind of classification, but, but basically by thinking about the kind of classifying arrows or arrows into omega, we get corresponding ideas of logic. So we get and, or, true, false, implies, not, and so on. And we can also get ideas like exists and for all. Now, the details of those things are a bit more complicated. If you have a look at my um, videos on topos theory and on the Mitchell Benabar language, um, that will become a bit more clear. I've also put some videos in the description of this video, which sort of relate these ideas a bit more carefully um, with some of the ideas of adjoint functors. So basically what I'm trying to say is that there is a sort of intuitionistic logic underlying a topos and it's this intuitionistic logic that we are sort of using to describe the true nature of these categories of smooth spaces, which. Okay then, so how is this synthetic differential geometry set up formally? Okay. Now there's um, different sorts of points of view on it. And to be honest, it's, um, it's a rather complex thing to uh, understand fully. Uh, because the real issue is that, in a sense, the price that we've paid for having these kind of infinitesimals, which are really very useful things for understanding a lot of things about geometry, but the price we pay for it is that our logic is no longer classical and our, what we might call the real number line, um, our continuum, is no longer really the same as the ordinary real numbers. I mean, ordinary real numbers don't have the property that um, we can find some of them that are not zero that give zero when we square them, okay? In ordinary arithmetic, if a number has the property that squaring it gives zero, then that number must be zero. But we have a kind of different situation here and that's basically because we are um, working in a sort of world with alien logic in some sense. Now, that sounds waffly, and it is, and there's a much more kind of concrete way to talk about all these things. Basically, um, these smooth spaces can be thought of as objects in a topos. So we have this sort of topos, bold S, and we think of this as the category of smooth spaces. Okay, so the um, the ob each object in this category is a smooth space, and the kind of arrows in this category are maps between smooth spaces. And so you can think of this as something sort of analogous to the category set, okay? A lot of kind of classical mathematics can be thought of in terms of this category sets. We're interested in sets and functions between sets um, normally. But now we're interested in smooth spaces and maps between smooth spaces. So basically, formally, what I'm just trying to say to start with is that we have this category S and we're thinking of this as a category of smooth spaces. So really, what I have to do is to describe the nature of this category S. And again, there are different ways to do this. So, so I'm So what I want to do is describe this category. 
Now, basically, this category is a topos with some special kind of structure. Now, I'm going to describe that structure with the internal language of this topos, with the mitchell benabar language, essentially. Um, there are alternative sort of approaches to describing the structure of this. You can think of it purely in terms of intuitionistic logic. You can think of it in terms of local set theories, as advocated by J.L. Bell who also wrote a fantastic book called A Primer of Infinitesimal Analysis, which is a great book about this subject that's really quite accessible. Anyway, um, I'm going to describe this category now. So the first thing to say about this is that it's a topos. OK, so it has lots of nice properties. It has all small limits, small co-limits, exponential objects, sub-object classifier, power objects and so on. It's a very uh, pleasant sort of thing is a topos. And the next thing to say about this uh, category is it's uh, it's what you call a non-trivial topos, okay? That just means it's not kind of degenerate. So a trivial topos is one where every object is a terminal object. But um, we're assuming that S is not a trivial topos. So um, it's got interesting structure and the initial object's not isomorphic to the terminal object. So really we're just saying that S is a sort of topos and it's not a degenerate one. It's one with lots of interesting structure. Um, and as I've already said, we're gonna think of the objects of S as spaces, smooth spaces, and the arrows of S as maps between those spaces. So that's the kind of starting situation. And what this is really doing for us so far by saying that S is like this is it's enabling us to use certain language, okay? Because since we know that S is a topos, we know that it's going to have a sort of internal language of that topos, this mitchell benabar language, and we can then use that to talk about the other things that are going on. So basically what we have now is a few axioms which are basically proposing that certain objects and arrows exist within this kind of so-called category of smooth spaces, okay? And in a sense, it's almost analogous to what's going on with Euclid, right? Euclid sort of starts by saying, okay, we have logic and we can make such and such arguments. And then he says, well, let's suppose that we have these structures and those structures and the other structures and we can do these things with them. And then eventually, he can kick off and start actually building theories, okay? And in a similar sort of way, we're starting out by saying we have this topos of smooth spaces, that it's a non-trivial topos, and then we can start proposing particular structural features of this uh, category of smooth spaces. Basically, we're going to start proposing the existence of certain objects and arrows with different properties. And then when we're finished, there's, of course, the question of how do we know that that kind of um, construction idea makes sense? But I mean, just before I get into this, I, I just want to say something um, about axiomatic systems in general, uh, because I think one has to be careful when one's setting up axioms for a system. I mean, for example, Suppose I was trying to build some kind of bad geometry kind of system. And I started out, let's say my first axiom was that you can draw a line through any pair of distinct points. And then I went on and on. And eventually um, I made some up some other axioms and I deduced that if you have two distinct points on the circumference of a circle, then there's no line through those points. Okay. Well, then I'd have a contradiction. OK, my original axiom would be in contradiction with one of my theorems. And then the only kind of way out of that would basically be that if there were no lines or there were no points or there were no circles or something. OK, basically, if you're not careful, your axioms can lead to contradictions and that might lead to inadvertent proofs that things which you want to exist in your theory don't exist because if they did, logic would break, etc. And so 
we want to be careful about that. We want to be careful about setting up axioms of systems which end up being pure nonsense. In other words, we want to be sure that the kind of axioms we choose are sensible and don't lead to contradictions or kind of features of our system which we don't want. And so there's a couple of kind of um, safeguards that we have against that in this kind of synthetic differential geometry, which we're trying to axiomatize. The first thing is that the first thing is that there's a sort of formal way that we can think about the implications of our axioms. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but if you have a look at J.L. Bell's book, Toposes and Local Set Theories, he describes these things called local set theories. And basically what they are, are kind of like type theories. So they're like formal system, formal, so they're like formal systems for manipulating symbols. And within those, you can basically formally generate statements, um, which he would say are talking about local set theory, but they're actually corresponding to things going on in topos theory. So essentially, Bell cooks up this language of local set theories, which can sort of generate these statements using formal rules. And all of those kind of statements reflect constructions in topos theory. Okay, so it's kind of like a formalization of topos theory, if you like. And using that kind of framework of local set theories, um, one can sort of formalize this idea of starting out with axioms and following the formal rules of implication and follow and following formal kind of rules of implication to find the facts that follow from those axioms within well local set theory but it would correspond to topos theory so in other words bell has this kind of language which allows us to think very formally about what the consequences of these kind of axioms are so that's one good thing that puts us on a more kind of firm footing. But even better than that, uh, there are actually models of this synthetic differential geometry. So mathematicians have thought about specific structures coming from other places like standard kind of differential geometry and other kinds of fancy areas. And they found actual mathematical structures, which are essentially um, having the same features that we're proposing um, our structures to have in this synthetic differential geometry. So it's a little bit like um, when people were talking about non-Euclidean geometry. They started out with some kind of ideas of axioms, but then they found that there were literal physical models like the sphere or the pseudosphere, which you could actually think of as being the kind of background where these non-Euclidean geometries were happening within. And in a similar sort of way, one can make connections with more kind of concrete models, which do the same things as we're supposing are going on in this kind of model of synthetic differential geometry. Now, saying all that, uh, let's just get stuck into the axiom. So, okay, what are our axioms then? Well, our first axiom, which we'll call R1, is that we have a certain object called R in our category S of smooth spaces. And we call R the smooth line. And basically this is our number line. This is our sort of version of something like the set of real numbers, but it's a bit different, okay? So this R is an object in our category of smooth spaces, or we could say R is a space. And there are some sort of arrows associated with it with special properties. Now, to say it briefly, I could just say that R is a non-trivial field. OK, it's a non-trivial field with an idea of addition and multiplication. And basically, it's kind of like the real numbers in a sense. Since we're working in this topos and everything's a bit different, we want to be very kind of formal about what's actually going on. So the first thing is to say that R has these two points, zero and one, okay? So since S is a topos, 
it has a terminal object, an arrow from a terminal object to another object. So here, for example, this arrow from um, our terminal object to R, that's what we call a point of R, okay? And our object R has these two points called one and zero. So if we want to visualize it, I mean, this is a bit fuzzy, but basically our terminal objects, something like this, here's our number line, and then there's a map from this to our number line, which we call zero, and that's picking out the number zero on our number line. And also there's another map, let's use a different color. There's another map called one, and that's picking out the number one on our number line. Now, because S is a topos, we have the idea of being able to form the categorical product of pairs of objects, okay? So in this kind of scenario, our objects are like smooth spaces, and when we take the product of them, that's quite an interesting kind of idea. So in particular, if we take the product of this smooth line with itself, we get the smooth plane, okay? Which we can kind of think of as an infinite plane. And what we're saying is that there's a map or an arrow from R times R to R, which is basically giving us an idea of addition. And then the idea is that we have this kind of addition map from R times R to R. So for example, maybe up here we have two comma one, and so this map would send that to three on our number line. And in a similar way, we have another binary operation, which is times. So this is a bit peculiar. If we're working in set, this would be very easy to think about because we would just um, be having like, in that case, R times R would just be a, the set of all pairs of numbers and then of course, it's easy to think about these kind of operations like plus that takes in two numbers and adds them together. But in this kind of situation, things are a bit more abstract. So we just know at the moment that R times R is a sort of categorical product of this object R with itself, and that we just have this arrow that we're calling plus from that back to R. So how do we know that it works like addition? Well, because we're going to make some kind of axioms which end up saying that this acts like addition and that this acts like multiplication. And basically, we're going to describe some sort of axioms which are saying in what sense all of this kind of structure is giving us what I was calling a non-trivial field, okay? So there are loads of different proposals about how these different operations work. But the important thing to start with is that we have points zero and one of R, and we also have these two binary operations that we're calling plus and times. So like I say, there are various sort of facts that we want to be true of these kind of arrows. And here's the first one. We want this to be true. Now, this is really a statement you could think of it as a statement um, about the internal logic of this topos, okay? And if this is unclear to you, you can see my video on the mitchell Benabal language. Uh, but I'm going to unpack this anyway, okay? So here x is a variable of type r, okay? So if you think about what this means, like a really good approach, if... Um, these ideas seem sort of alien to you, is just to think about what this stuff means in terms of ordinary mathematics, okay? So it's just saying that zero plus a real is that real, okay? In terms of ordinary mathematics. However, we are working in this topos. We are not assured that things are working like they do in ordinary mathematics. And so how do we actually interpret this formally? Well, essentially, what this is saying is that it's, I'll unpack it. So it's basically saying that the 
a subobject consisting of the x in R with no restrictions is contained in the subobjects of x in R with the property that this is true. So to understand this, we just need to work out what these two things mean. And these are what we call extensions in the mitchell benabal language. And there are ways to work out what they mean. So this is really just sort of shorthand for saying that this is the set of, well, it's not the set, that's the wrong word, but it's it's for subobject of X in R such that true. Okay. Um, and that is really just the subobject classified by the interpretation of true over X in R. And so let's work out that interpretation. So that's going to be true after exclamation mark R. We want the subobject classified by that. So let's now draw a picture. So here's R, here's exclamation mark R, that's an arrow from that into one. And then we have true as a point of omega. And we're interested in what's the subobject of R classified by this arrow. So in other words, if we think about this uh, arrow true, into omega, if we pull back this arrow, if we pull back this, if we pull back this monomorphism along this arrow, that's going to give us this subobject here of R. And it turns out that that's actually the um, the full subobject of R. So essentially, what I'm saying is that this whole thing just ends up being the full subobject of R. Okay. So to cut a long story short, um, all, what all of this stuff is saying. is that what we have here is the identity arrow of R, the full subobject. So essentially what we're saying is that the full subobject of R is contained in this. So if you think about what that means classically, um, here we have R, here we have the full subobject of R. And we're saying that all of this is contained in here. So actually, that really means that the this has to actually be equal to the full subobject of R. So really what all this stuff boils down to So really what all this uh, boils down to, what this statement's equivalent to saying is that this is the full subobject of R, or it's equivalent to it. So, okay, now we just need to work out what this is. Well, firstly, what's it mean when we write plus of two things? Well, this is really just shorthand. So, when we write 0 plus x, for example, really, plus is a binary operator, and it has two inputs, 0 and x. And we're saying that that's equal to X. And so what is this? Okay, so let me do this in steps, all right? So firstly, uh, 
the first thing we've got going on here is we've got two things that are equal. So what we can then say is that this is going to be chi of identity r comma identity r of these two equal things. Okay. So this would be the interpretation of so this will be the interpretation of plus zero comma x interpreted over x in R. And then over here we have the interpretation of x interpreted over x in R. And we're interested in the subobject classified by that. So now we just need to sort of burrow in here and work out these interpretations. So this is going to be equivalent to the subobject classified by chi 1r, 1r of plus 0 after exclamation mark r, comma, 1R, comma, identity R. And we're interested in the subobject classified by that. So, okay, we've worked this out so far. Now, how are we going to understand what it means? Well, let's start with this. Okay, so what's this mean? Well, if we have R, then we can do exclamation mark r that's the map sending all these um, things in the line to the terminal object and then after that we can do zero and that's going to be this composition here so basically this composition sends everything in the smooth line to zero okay there's a map from the smooth line to itself now the other way over here we just have the identity arrow of r there it is. And so since we have these two maps, we can think of the sort of pair of them in the usual kind of producty pair way as giving us this map from R to R times R. So this is the normal kind of product picture, if you like, with these projections. And then the next thing is that we have this binary operation, this addition, and that's going to be an arrow back to R. And now this whole thing is forming one long arrow to R. We also have another one, which is um, just the identity arrow. So that's another big arrow to R. And once again, we can form this sort of producty pair of these. Um, and that's what we've got here. Okay, that's this. And that's going to be an arrow to R times R. So let's give this arrow a name. Um, let's call it M. All right, so this is M. So what's M do? Okay, um, so here M is zero exclamation mark R comma identity R added and identity r okay so this m here this is this arrow and it's going from r to r times r so how does it work well let's say we pick a point of r let's say a point v okay so what's m after v well it's going to be the sum of 
zero exclamation mark r after v comma v comma v okay which is just going to be and what this is going to be is it's of zero plus v and v so basically to cut a long story short m sends a point v of r to zero plus v comma v okay um, so that's basically what is going on here and so our big claim is that one of r is identical to this sub object classified by uh chi of this thing after m okay so this is our big claim so basically our situation looks like this we have this arrow m which i was just describing from r to r times r we also have a sub object of r times r which is this one here which is called one r comma one r okay and that looks like that and that's actually a sub object so we can sort of visualize it as um the sub object of this smooth plane where the coordinate of the point on the x-axis is the same as the coordinate on the y-axis or if you like i mean if this was classical or if you like if this was a classical situation you'd say this is the set of all points on the plane which have the x coordinate equal to the y coordinate and so this is our sort of um and so this here is our sort of diagonal sub object 1r comma 1r and it turns out that what we're actually saying here um i'll i'll prove this momentarily but what we're really actually saying here is that our claim is basically going to boil down to saying that m is in 1r comma 1r in other words what we're saying is that this arrow m which we've been describing um it sends every sort of point well this is one of so in other words or at least this is the main take home message we're really saying that m sends any point v to a pair like this where these two entries are basically equal okay because this pair is actually going to end up being part of this kind of diagonal sub object okay but we'll get there let's see how this comes out formally so this is what we've got so far right we've basically showed that our initial statement um which was written like this so what we've got so far then we've basically shown that this initial statement which was this is equivalent to this new kind of transformed statement which looks like this where m is as shown here okay um so what this means what we're saying is that this sub object here is equivalent to this sub object here so that means that these two things have to have the same classifying arrows so the classifying arrow of the thing on the left must be equal to the classifying arrow of the thing on the right okay um so the classifying arrow of the thing on the left is going to be t after exclamation mark r and the classifying arrow of this thing on the right is going to be chi of identity r comma identity r of m and so this holds if and only if this holds and this holds if and only if m is in identity r comma identity r so just to summarize what we've learned we basically have that this sort of formula in the mitchell benabar language is true if and only if we have that this m here is in this sub object 1r comma 1r 
So there we have it. And if you think about it, this actually means um, you can sort of understand why this makes sense by just thinking about what this means uh, in terms of set. OK, because basically what we have here, we have this arrow here, which is M. This is an arrow from R to R times R. And if this was happening in set, then this kind of diagonal thing is basically just picking out the subset of pairs of reals which have the first entry equal to the second entry and what we're really saying with this kind of statement here is that um all of the values is that m sends everything to um, things in this diagonal okay so this is in here in other words, there exists a K such that M is equal to one R comma one R after K. So yet another way to look at this, just to make it a bit more clear is to say that, well, what's this mean? Well, what it means is that there exists an arrow K such that we have this is equal to this 1r 1r after k which is going to be k comma k and if you think about it the only way that this can work is if this equals this equals the k we choose so we'd have to have that this thing here is the identity arrow is the K that we choose. And so finally we get this as our sort of most reduced version of what we started with initially. And so what this is really saying is that if we start with R and then we map everything to the terminal object and then we carry on and we send everything to zero. So in other words, if we get zero and then also we do another thing where we just do an identity map. And then if we pair those two things together, And then if we do addition, then that composition, let's say we compose these two. And then if we do composition, then that composition arrow we end up with is actually just going to be an identity arrow. And that's the top and bottom of it. So hopefully you can see um, that there's a lot going on in these small formulas. And I actually think this is a really good thing. Um, it makes a subject tricky if you want to really fully grasp it. But on the other hand, we can kind of get visual contact with all of these different ways of looking at things. I mean, um, you would have thought the idea that adding zero to a number, for example, and returning the original number is like a really simple idea. But I think this makes it very clear how many different perspectives and features there are of these sorts of operations. And so in some sense, it feels as though one is um, losing some kind of rigor or losing some kind of vision by setting up geometry in a synthetic way like this. But on the other hand, the fact that we have to be so specific
about everything and that we have to have proper ways that we can describe this language and that we have to describe everything properly um, in this general language and that we have to make our arguments general, I think actually can add clarity to the situation because it can be a lot more clear what things we're, because it can be a lot more clear what kind of arguments we're using and what we're relying on and how we can visualize what we're doing in different ways. I mean, I personally feel like with the standard sort of arithmetic of real numbers, there's a lot of, I don't have a good word for it. I don't know what the right word for it is, but um, there's sort of this situation where I think a lot of mathematicians feel like they're doing something very rigorous, but really they're so used to what they're doing that um, they're not questioning the sort of elementary features of what's going on. I mean, th for example, um, most mathematicians think of real numbers, at least intuitively, as infinite decimals. So how are you adding them together? What's your formula? What's your algorithm? How do you know that the standard laws of arithmetic are satisfied and so on? Um, so these kind of things are often sort of glazed over and I think they just end up going to the back of the practitioner's mind and um, sort of it's assumed that, oh, you know, the arithmetic of reals is something I was doing since I was a teenager and I know how that works and that's trivial and it, it becomes a sort of um, unquestioned assumption that isn't even seen. And I think one of the beauties of working in an axiomatic system like this is it, that it brings everything to the forefront. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is lay out the axioms of synthetic differential geometry. And I'm really just discussing this first axiom R1, uh, because the way it's laid out in this uh, book, Bell's book, A Primer for Infinitesimal Analysis, there's actually a few different sort of features of this smooth line space R, which are described. So we're basically trying to get across this notion that it corresponds with a non-trivial field. And like I say, we have a zero, we have one, we have a form of addition and a form of multiplication, and there are various properties that it satisfies. So this is the first one, and I've covered this in some detail. Um, and there are various other properties as well. So um, here's the next one. This says that for any variables X and Y of type R, we have X plus Y is Y plus X. And once again, we can use our knowledge of mitchell benabar language to unpack this. So um, if we just sort of think about this, what this means in terms of extensions and convert into interpretations, it's basically saying that the interpretation of x plus y equals y plus x interpreted over these variables x and y in R is equal to true after exclamation mark R times R. And then if we just unpack this, we just sort of um, calculate what this interpretation is uh, and work it all out. We basically get that what this boils down to is saying that plus is the same as plus after this switch, P2 after P1. So basically we have this situation where if we have two inputs and we work out the sum of them, we'll get the same result as if we switch the inputs and then do the sum which is the kind of point-free way of saying this, if you like. I mean, uh, this is sometimes something that happens in programming, for example. Um, you can talk about a statement in terms of variables. Sometimes people say things like dummy variables. They mean it doesn't really matter what you call these things. We could call them X and Y. We could call them A and B. In a sense, um, the fact that we're naming these things um, is like adding redundant information into our maths. But by sort of working out the interpretation of what this means, 
we can boil it down to sort of a pure kind of diagram in category theory like this. And we're basically just saying that this diagram commutes. Okay, so there are other kind of parts of R1. I'm not going to go through them all in such detail, but basically this just says, okay, so sometimes I write dot instead of times. So maybe I should put times there. Okay. Um, but this just says that one times X is X. Uh, this says that X times Y is Y times X. This is the associativity of addition, the associativity of multiplication, distributivity. And here's another one. Um, it's always true that not zero equals one. Okay. Okay, so another part of this axiom R1 is basically that we have some kind of an analog of negative numbers. So in particular, there's a map that we call minus from R to R. And another thing that holds true is that X plus minus x equals zero. Okay, so okay, so our first axiom then, R1, is basically saying that we have this non-trivial field R. So R comes with a point called zero, a point called one, a binary operation called plus, a binary operation called times, and also a unary operation called minus. So these are all the different arrows which go into R, and then there are different properties that these things have. So in particular, we want it to be true that zero plus X is X, where X is a variable of type R. We want it to be true that X plus minus X is always zero. We want one times X to be X. We want x plus y to be y plus x. We want 1 times x to be x. We want x times y to be y times x. We want x times y to be y times x. We want addition to be associative. We want multiplication to be associative. We want to have the distributive law for addition and multiplication. We want to have that one is not equal to zero. And here's another one. Whenever X is not zero, we want to be able to find one over X. So we're saying that if X is not zero, then that implies that there exists a Y such that X times Y is equal to one. So we could call such a Y one over X in this case. So this is basically the existence of multiplicative inverses, at least for things that we can show are not zero. Now, it turns out that we have infinitesimals, but now it turns out that we have infinitesimals and trying to do one over an infinitesimal can cause problems, but that's not really an issue here because no infinitesimal will satisfy this, okay? It turns out that these infinitesimals are so small that we can't say that they're not equal to zero. Okay, so the next thing we have is an ordering, okay? So we don't just have a field, we have an ordered field. And also we can get square roots for positive elements. So this is basically what our next axiom says. So firstly, how do we formalize this idea of having this ordering? Well, that's going to be a relation, okay? So we can think of it as a sub-object of R times R. Now, to be clear about the notation, I'll call this sub-object sub L for less than, but I'll very soon shift to a different notation. So basically, since this is a sub-object of R times R, it's going to have a classifying arrow, which we could call chi of L. That's going to be an arrow from R times R to omega. 
And so when we do chi of L on X comma Y, that's going to be true when we have X. And so when we do chi of L on variables X and Y of type R, then if that's true, that means X and Y are in this relation L, okay? And in that case, we write X is less than Y. So we think of writing X less than Y as a sort of abbreviation for this kind of statement. Okay. And so really this relation L means that X is less than Y. And so we can think about what this means for these variables of type R. We can even substitute them for other things. Anyway, we're going to suppose that this relation satisfies various properties now. So we're going to have these variables x, y, and z of type R, and we're going to suppose these different properties. So this is transitivity. So if x is less than y, and y is less than z, then x is less than z. It's not true that x is less than x. If x is less than y, and then we add z to both things, we get that x is, we get that x plus z is less than y plus z. If x is less than y and zero is less than z, then x times z is less than y times z. So ordering is preserved by multiplication by positive numbers. Zero is less than one. Any x is either greater than zero or less than one. And then this next one is the existence of square roots, which is another thing we're assuming. So it says that if x is positive, then there exists a y, such that x is equal to y squared. And so we might like to call that y square root of x. And finally, if x is not equal to y, then either x is less than y or y is less than x. So all of this makes pretty good sense. Now let's get on to the infinitesimals and the sort of special results which are coming from this kind of synthetic differential geometry. So this axiomatic system, which I'm describing, is what Bell calls basic smooth infinitesimal analysis in his book, A Primer of Infinitesimal Analysis. So we're going to suppose we have our nil square infinitesimals. So this is a subobject of the smooth line, and it's basically consisting of the x in R with the property that x squared is zero. And also we want an extra logic operation. So we have uh, for all and exists, we want this, which means unique existence. So for a formula phi, what this says is there exists a unique x in A such that phi, okay? And this is really just an abbreviation for this expression here. And so to read this properly, we're saying that there exists an x such that phi and for all x and x dash, of type A, if we have phi, and also phi with x replaced with x dash, then that implies that x is equal to x dash. So this is really this kind of normal idea that, uh, yes, there exists something that satisfies phi, but also if two things satisfy phi, then um, they have to be equal. And so using this, we can give our sort of proper statements of um, synthetic differential geometry, our real underlying axioms. So the first one is micro straightness. And so what this is really saying is it's saying that for any F, which is a map from R to the power of del, so what this micro state, so what this micro straightness axiom is saying is that for any f in r to the power of delta, so if you like, for any map from delta to r, 
we have that there exists a unique A in R and there exists a unique B in R such that for all nil square infinitesimals epsilon, we have f of epsilon equals a plus b times epsilon. And here really this a is going to be f of zero. Okay, and then the second and final axiom is constancy. Okay, so this one here, which we've just talked about, is sometimes called the principle of micro straightness. And our final principle is this principle of constancy. And basically what this one says is, well, and so what the principle of constancy says is that for any F, which is a map from R to R, for all X in R, and for all nil square infinitesimals epsilon, if we have F of X plus epsilon, equals f of x, then that implies that f is a constant function, basically, or more precisely, for all x in r and for all y in r, f of x equals f of y. And that's it. These are the all the axioms for basic smooth infinitesimal analysis. Now, I mean, you can go further. You can say you have things like sine and cosine functions and introduce extra things and extra axioms. And the coverage of this kind of subject is slightly different in other treatments by other authors, for example, McClarty. But, but I mean, but I mean, this is the sort of essence of the idea. And so using these axioms and using the mitchell benabal language or local set theory, we can do infinitesimal analysis and it gives us this kind of new sort of modern approach, a different approach to thinking about all of this lovely differential geometry. Okay, so let me explain an idea which is called the idea of actions. So suppose we have a Cartesian closed category C and let's suppose that A is an object of this category. Now we're going to form a new category, which we're going to call C to the power of A. And let's think of this as the category of actions of A on C. So this is the category we want to define. It's called C to the power of A. So what are its objects and what are its arrows? Well, the objects of this category are pairs of an object X of this category C and an arrow from A times X to X. We'll call that epsilon. So you can think of epsilon as like an endomorphism of X, an arrow from X to itself, but one that's sort of parameterized by A. So think about, for example, a dynamical system, but where the update function changes with time, right? So think about like a plastic bag blowing in the wind. Um, the wind blows, that's a map from the atmosphere of Earth to itself, but the wind direction changes with time. So if you think of A as time and X as the atmosphere, then um, you have this sort of wind flow, which changes its nature with time. So it's like a time dependent dynamical system. And this is a similar sort of idea. Um, so, okay, these are the objects. What are the arrows of this category? Well, an arrow from an object like this to let's make up another object. This one's X dash comma epsilon dash. So an arrow from one of these to the other is going to be, is going to, so, so an arrow F from one of these objects to another um, corresponds with a map from, corresponds to an arrow from X to X dash 
in our original category, which has the property that this diagram I'm drawing commutes. Okay, so this is our idea of an arrow um, from one object to another in this category c to the power of a. So what does any of this have to do with smooth spaces, you may ask? So there's actually, so there's also an elaboration of this kind of concept, which is very interesting because what about if we want to select specific maps, which actually respect some extra kind of structure? So in particular, let's suppose now that um, our object A, which we're kind of using to define things, comes with an arrow from A times A to A, let's call it alpha. So we could think of this almost like a sort of binary operation. And also let's suppose A comes with a special point, let's say A zero. So given all this kind of information, we can restrict our idea of action to those actions which are sort of compatible with alpha and A naught. So now what we're basically talking about, and we could also write this, maybe we'll write this as uh, C to the power of A box, okay? Um, and this is basically the subcategory of uh, C to the power of A, which is kind of respecting this extra structure. We're basically interested now in the actions which are compatible with alpha and A naught. So, so if our object A comes with this kind of extra structure, this kind of binary operation alpha and special point A zero, then we can also think about what we might call the, um, then we can also think about a sort of subcategory of C to the power of A, which is the subcategory the full subcategory of c to the power of a on the kind of objects which correspond to these kind of actions which are compatible with the structure of alpha and a zero so let's <coughs> so let's call such a subcategory c to the power of a tilde okay and this is going to be a subcategory of c to the power of a now, basically, it's the full subcategory um, on the objects, on the objects A, comma, epsilon, which respect the structure of alpha and A in the sense that we have epsilon of alpha of A, comma, B, comma x equals epsilon of a comma epsilon of b comma x and epsilon of a naught comma x equals x and this holds for any a b and x okay so this is the kind of idea and so basically we can think of this kind of thing I mean, um, let's say we have, for example, some kind of group structure. So maybe this is like a group operation and this is like the identity element of our group. And so in this case, we can think of C to the power of A tilde as the kind of actions which respect the kind of group. So what does any of this have to do with the category of smooth spaces? Well, here's the big idea. So um, we have this category S of smooth spaces. And then it turns out that we can use this kind of idea. So if we think about S to the power of R, and we'll basically and we can basically think of this category is formed with the action of this um, additive group of R, okay? Because R is an object in this category S, 
and R has this um, kind of binary operation called plus and it also has this special element zero and these are forming a group and so as we've sort of defined here um, we can refer to s to the power of r and this is this kind of category formed based on this action with r okay um, where we're thinking of r as a group So we can, so we can really think of this kind of category here. And so basically the objects of this category are going to be pairs X comma R times X epsilon X, which respects the kind of group structure of um, this smooth line. So basically with the property that um, epsilon of A plus B comma X equals epsilon of A comma epsilon of B comma X and also epsilon of zero comma X equals X. So we can really think of the kind of objects of this category as flows. OK, so it's quite fascinating already that we have this kind of category and the object of it are flows um, on spaces. OK, because really this is describing for us a kind of flow on a space. OK, if we specify this is the time and this is a point, then we get a new point, okay? Um, and if we give our time a zero, then we get the original point. And if we compose our flows, then that's like um, adding the times on, okay? Um, so this is already quite a fascinating idea, I think. Um, and then the other thing is that our nil square infinitesimals is really just a sub of our smooth line R. So we have another kind of similar idea. Um, in addition to having S to the power of R, which is really our sort of category of flows, we have S to the power of D. We have S to the power of delta. Okay, and this is really, if you think about it, it's a category of vector fields. And this is our category of flows. And then there's a natural sort of functor, um, which we could call star, which takes a flow to its vector field. So, if you, so basically, if you think about a flow, um, that's a map from R times X to X, but really, Delta is just a subobject of R, so we can just think about how that map works on delta. And that um, gives us this functor. So more precisely, there's going to be a sort of inclusion arrow from delta to R. And so we're going to have And so we're going to have this kind of situation. And then this composition is going to give us the object that epsilon is mapped to under this functor here. Okay. Um, but the fascinating thing, so I mean this vector, so, but I mean the fascinating thing is like this functor, which I've just described, all this is really doing we have this sort of space and every point has this sort of flow line associated with it. And this kind of um, functor is basically just taking any particular flow. Because I mean, the fascinating thing is that this functor is really just sort of giving derivatives in a sense. I mean, we have this sort of space and we have a load of flows and the way this functor is working on any particular flow um, 
is it's just sort of giving the vector at the kind of zero point on the flow. Um, and that's kind of how this functor is working. So the really fascinating thing that's going on here is that this functor, which I've just described, it actually has a right adjoint. So that goes from our category of vector fields to our category of flows. And how this works is it sends a particular vector field to this kind of object corresponding to all of the sort of flows which correspond to solutions to that kind of um, system defined by those vector flows. So think about all the kind of flows that you could have which are sort of induced by this vector field. Um, this is the kind of object which this right adjoint to our star functor sends a particular vector field to. So this really gives us pretty much the idea of solving differential equations, but completely in terms of these lovely functors in category theory.